Um, I'm Tom Schofield. I'm a, an artist and sometimes designer and sometimes academic at Newcastle University in the UK. Um, and I'm going to sort of pick up Nathan's uh, theme about error, artificial intelligence, and, and what you can do with it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think so the practices, uh, the methods, and the rhetorics of AI are absurd, why that produces kinds of absurdity, and, and what you can do with it effectively. Um, so, uh, so sometimes AI absurdity is funny. Um, so this slide is from a, uh, an AI-trained meme generator. So someone's effectively got a bunch of common memes, found the text in them, trained a similar sort of uh, text generating AI, and what it's found, and to, to get something that reproduces texts in a similar style. And it, and it kind of does. <laughs> you know, it, it sort of does. Um, but in the process of doing so, it, it, there's just something, I mean, I was very relieved when someone laughed during Nathan's presentation about the definitions, um, because um, it, there's something about the way that, that these things take a, a sort of tilt at culture and then miss. Uh, and in this, I mean, you may not find this particular one funny, but it also has this sort of like meditative kind of cone-like thing that the more you look at it, the more you think, what? Um, sometimes it's really not funny. Um, so what you're looking at here is, um, well, it's a screen grab of a tweet. Uh, the tweet is by uh, a medical doctor, and the medical doctor is um, talking about this phenomenon of um, so-called AI triage apps. So these are apps which are in the UK literally re replacing uh, GP services, and their function is to sort of a, you know, get a sense of what's wrong with a person and then signpost them to, you know, to the hospital or to the dentist or to the gum clinic or, or whatever it is they need. And, um, and um, in this case, uh, this, is, this is a conversation that's followed a 48-year-old person with a, with a heavy smoking habit who's starting to, to feel pain down their left arm and shoulder and so you know evidently that you know that's I mean I'm not that kind of doctor but suggests perhaps a heart attack and the AI, the AI is going um, you know have you been burned recently you know, have you bumped your arm and so and the, the thing with this to me is, is it's not just that it's wrong um, it's that it's sort of close enough to be right and so but yet so so radically wrong that it's actually absurd um, and as I say, so sometimes this can be funny and sometimes it's, you know, potentially deadly serious. Uh, some friends of, our, of ours, um, some friends of, well, some friends of ours, um, Wen Zablel, Dan Foster Smith and Kipros Kiprianu, um, <clears throat> produced a, a work called Quack, um, so, you know, QA, anyway, you get the pun, uh, such as it is, um, where we, we produced a sort of parody AI triage app which does kind of diagnose things, and also a kind of an investor pitch uh, video, which you can see at the link there if you're interested. So in this case, it's, you know, the, my problem is that I'm 54 years old, I'm 42, by the way, uh, and I'm male, um, and I'm also bored. Um, okay, so, um, so, in, so I, I'm not talking about libraries exactly, I'm, I'm, this is building from the works that are in the show, excuse me, um, but hopefully I'll, I'll come back to those more kind of, um, significantly at the end. So this is not really what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so if, uh, if there are any kind of sort of proper scholars of the absurd, oh, I, I should have had, I, had a, I have a disclaimer for this talk, which is that it's sort of a thinking aloud thing. Um, so this is a sort of um, a set of thoughts that I've been having alongside making this work and others, um, which I'm using this as an excuse to, to sort of solidify some thinking about. So you're the sort of stooge to that, and I, I'm, I hope it's still interesting and useful. In this kind of lineage, um, the absurd is, is a paradox to do with, it's a religious thing basically, it's to do with the transcendence of God, the impossibility of, of, of proofs, uh, and the act of faith as being a sort of um, a suspension of, of, of reliance on those uh, sort of evidential things. Uh, so it's not about that. Uh, it's also, I'm also not about to do a, run, a rundown of other uses of the absurd in art making. Um, or in literature, uh, partly because I don't really have the art history to do that, uh, we certainly don't have the time here, but also really what I'm interested in is um, its sort of coincidence with the everyday and uh, with everyday culture. Um, it's also what I'm talking about, very similar to other kinds of sort of normal artistic method like detournement, uh, distortion, parody, but I think there's something, I think, I think, I think, there's something particular about the way that um, 
absurdity arises through and with AI. Uh, and so, so here we go. Uh, it's a bit rubbish to use dictionary definitions, um, but I'm including this because I find it so unsatisfying. Uh, so my dictionary has the absurd as wildly unreasonable, illogical, or inappropriate, or something that arouses derision or, or ridicule. Um, and the example here, I think, is really interesting. So you know, uh, it may look absurd, but having a treadmill desk could improve your attention span. And you know, it's almost as if this is something that you could actually believe might come out of an AI text generator. So why, but why does a, a treadmill at your desk look absurd? It's not just that it's a stupid idea or that it's wrong. It, it, it sort of subverts our, expectation, our expectations of the everyday. It sort of approaches what's reasonable or what's normal or what's sort of natural uh, or what's a, a kind of cultural given. And just, but it's just not, it's like, huh? you know, it's the same thing as the, um, as the first GIF. So, so this is my version. Um, so I'm going to start by defining the thing that I'm going to go and talk about for the next 20 minutes, which is probably a mistake. Um, so I think it's a subversion of this, like the cultural status quo that, it's, that, that is ridiculous in the way that irony is a sort of subversion of the status quo that's unfair. So like to evoke the words of the legend Alanis Morissette, what, like 10,000 spoons when all you need is a knife. It's not just bad luck. Um, it's sort of it's kind of like cosmically out of whack. You know, it's unfair in a sort of, in a sort of holistic, cosmic way. And so I think there's something, something comparable going on um, with, uh, with absurdity and AI absurdity in particular. Um, so some of the examples I'm going to give today are drawn from, uh, are not drawn from technology. They, they are indeed drawn from culture and, and sort of of the everyday. And, and this is my first. And let's see if the video plays. This see if the video plays. Uh, the video will not play. Okay, I can fill in. <laughs> it's, it's better with the effect. So, I don't know if you're familiar with this video. This is uh, Adriano Celentano, who's uh, an Italian pop, pop artist. And this pop song is a pop song um, which is in English, but it's not. Uh, and so, basically, it sort of mimics the kind of form and the sort of conventions of, of English pop songs. So it's got the uh-huhs and, and, and in a sort of, and you can kind of dive in and out of the references it comes. And it's all, and for a while you think, I'm just mishearing this, this really is English. Um, and then the more you listen, you realize actually no, it, it's, just, it's nonsense, the entire thing is nonsense. But there's something, it, like, there's something about it which first of all, draws your attention to the conventions of pop songs, it draws your attention to things about English, but then it blows that up in a really kind of peculiar and quirky way. Um, and so, and that's the bit that, that I'm interested in. You know, why is this, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of things wrong with this video, but the, uh, but the English is really kind of, you know, this video has been sort of doing the rounds for a while. Um, okay. Yeah, it doesn't want to play, but that's fine. Um, so comparably, I, I mean, I said I'm not going to go too much into sort of art historical examples. In literature, it's also a little bit like non sequitur. So uh, non sequitur is a conclusion or a statement that doesn't follow from what came before. So you know, you make a statement and then whatever follows it forms some kind of rupture. Um, so um, uh, so an example is from the from the novel Catch Twenty Two. So Yossari and the protagonist goes into a tent, and there's a guy doing some plumbing. Um, and so I'll, I'll just quote for a sec. Uh, what are you doing, Yossarian asked guardedly uh, when he entered the tent, although he saw it once. There's a leak in here, Orr said. I'm trying to fix it. Please stop it, said Yossarian. You're making me nervous. When I was a kid, Orr replied, I used to walk around all day with crab apples in my cheeks, one apple in each cheek. So, so it's gone from a conversation about plumbing to a conversation about walking around with apples in your cheeks. And so, you know, in the book, and indeed other books, this kind of use of non sequitur is done to, to jar you into, um, uh, for, for a literary effect. In this case, it, I guess it relates to sort of Yossarian's sort of sense of disconnection from the world he's been cast into uh, and, and is sort of involved with. Um, but it relies on... Um, this, you know, it relies on a sort of uh, kind of everyday rupture. Uh, and so I want to think about what, well, if we, if we have a look closely at that, um, can, can this sort of particular attention to these kinds of, of absurdity within AI, within AI 
allow us to create new things and also critique particular kinds of AI. And when I say critique, I, I don't mean a, a structured argument. I mean, you've probably got that so far. Um, it's, you know, it's the idea of, of suspending reality for a moment and, and having a look what happens when you do. And so another example where I think this happens um, is with toddlers. So, uh, so this, this picture came from uh, a series of kind of forums where people submit photos of their toddlers crying uh, with an explanation of why they are crying. So this particular little boy um, uh, um, is, is crying because he wanted his parent to switch off the sun so he could try out his, his pumpkin. And it's, and you know, I, this is probably quite a familiar story for, for those of you who are involved with caring for children. And um, so it gives a, you know, it gives a kind of a, like an inside view of how confusing and disorienting the world is for toddlers. Um, and by analogy, uh, for AIs and, 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 for, um, and for us when, when, we're, when we're working with them. And what this kind of reminds me of is, uh, so um, in, in the book Studies in Ethnomethodology, uh, so Garfinkel talks about so-called breaching experiments. Uh, so this, this is in the realm of sociology. And the idea of these experiments were, we rely on a kind of consensus uh, to understand culture and to, to understand the everyday. And so the question was, if, if we can momentarily sort of disrupt that or break that, um, what does it tell us about our interactions and about the way that we, uh, we collaborate to, to understand the sense of what we're doing all the time? And so that included things like uh, continually asking for clarification. So Garfinkel asked his students to just say, what do you mean all the time? Uh, so for example, uh, so one, one example dialogue is, hi Ray, how's your girlfriend feeling? Uh, what do you mean, how's she feeling? Do you mean physical or mental? I, I mean, how's she feeling? So what, just by asking a, asking a how question at the wrong moment, it's kind of um, what it draws attention to is the fact, well, everyone knows what you mean by how's she feeling, but, but how do we know how she's feeling? And this is the sort of ongoing construction of social facts and so forth. So, so the idea by introducing this kind of absurd rupture, ev no, Everyone's like really, really unsettled by these things. And there's a reason for it, because we rely on these consensuses, consen yeah, these consensuses to help us understand who we are and, and, and how we talk to one another. What have we got for time? I'm just checking the time. OK. Um, so, so I think there's, there's a, you know, again, it's not just that it's bad um, or, or wrong. Um, and, and again, just to return to this point, so, so something that's bad commits errors. So a machine that paints something white instead of painting something black. Something that's absurd does that um, uh, sometimes has a creative effect. So, so as we've seen, sometimes that can create comedy. Um, and, but quite often approaches a cultural norm and misses. So, so for example, an example of something that's bad, uh, the German uh, skincare brand uh, Nivea uh, had a, um, an advertising uh, campaign for I don't know, skincare or deodorant or something like that, uh, with the slogan, uh, white is purity. So that's not absurd. Um, that's a mis misreading of culture that's just bad. Yeah, so it's, and it's bad because it's self-defeating. You know, it, 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 it doesn't serve the purpose. It, it causes harm because it's discriminatory. It's racially insensitive, all that sort of thing. Um, by contrast, an, an absurd error creates connections, creates paradoxes and riddles that themselves can be productive because they can be unpacked. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, alongside this, we've got this other kind of absurdity um, to do with the sort of claims of AI um, so the, or the claims that are made for it. So, and this is, I think, why this is actually an urgent question to think about. Uh, so, for example, so this is a company that's actually called Superhuman. Uh, and uh, we've harnessed the power of auto artificial intelligence to automatically triage your email. And you know, if, if I was going to harness superhumanism, that's what, that would be my first place to put it. It's like email spam filters. And um, so, um, so yeah, so, so, it has, so it's also, it also happens through these kind of, through the, through the claims that are made for it, through the way it's, it's claimed to predict the future in a particular kind of way. Um, and then in the application, so the working with AI, this is sort of where I have a kind of personal connection. So I've already talked about its almost rightness, but there are other things that are absurd. So, so the metrics, 
Uh, so an image uh, classification algorithm which declares something to be 90% a fish. Um, or, I mean, you know, 90% sure it's a fish, but what does that really mean? In terms of the terminology, I'm going to come on to this in a minute, in terms of the training and the amount of the sort of disproportion, disproportionality, disproportionateness of the, um, the resources that are trained to making computers do things which we can do quite well ourselves. Um, uh, it's absurd in the way that, in the, in the practices it, 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 it uh, imposes on humans in terms of labeling and sourcing images. Um, so, so, for example, um, this is a, a graph which is produced uh, during the training of an, an image recognition algorithm, um, which, um, which I, I, I've been using in, in a work in progress project called Declassifiers, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. And so effectively what I'm trying to do is, is get a, a video analysis algorithm to tell me whether this is a field, whether this is a field with sheep in it, or if this is a game of badminton. Um, but the particular thing that's absurd about this, um, so these, so first of all, there's the um, there's the kind of overblownness of of the apparatus that are drawn to understanding what's happening along the way. Um, this shows how the training is performing along so-called epochs. So, so usually, particular kinds of training uh, in machine learning and AI do, do it cyclically. They do it and then they do it again and they do it again. And they get better each time. And these training cycles are called epochs. That epochs are a, a historical period of time. They have a particular sense in geology. Uh, they have a particular sense in astronomy. Uh, what they're not really about, as far as I'm understanding, is, um, is computer cycles. But they are now. And so the, the sort of construction of a mythology along the way it is like it's this kind of, um, it's very unironicness, I, I find completely absurd. Uh, so this is another example. Uh, so from the same project, this is. Um, uh, so AI makes us do absurd things when we use it. Uh, so this is a training video that I've been uh, testing the algorithms on. Um, so, uh, so as you can see, it's quite rightly identifying this as a field. Um, and in just a moment, hopefully, uh, we'll, um, you know, spoiler alert, <laughs> there might be sheep. Duh. <laughs> Have you ever been so tense waiting for a sheep? <laughs> I certainly haven't. Yes, no, no, yes. Okay, um, in order to make this, um, I, I had to go to really absurd lengths. Uh, so I had to write computer scrapers. I had to spend an inordinate amount of time fishing around with labels in files saying, this is an adequate picture of a sheep in a field. This is not a sheep in a field. Uh, and, so, and so even in the act of parody, you, you can't help but adopting these sort of absurd practices along the way. Oh, hang on, there we go. Um, by the way, so this is part of a, um, so, and absurdity also creeps in in the outputs, I hope. Uh, so in this particular project, um, the project is uh, called Declassifiers, Absurd Algorithmic Seeing from Above. And it's about um, spoofing drone seeing, uh, so visuals from drones, but not in a way to make it, to, to make the drones make mistakes, but in order to make them do absurd things, uh, so to behave in absurd ways, to think absurd things, um, and, and to produce a critique accordingly. Um, I've already talked about this a little bit, but I just want to show, um, this is the meme generator I started. Um, here are some more of its examples. Um, and I, I mentioned the idea of cones before. Um, so I've got this, this idea of sort of taking the absurd seriously. Uh, so uh, the text here is, is a, a traditional cone. Um, so a cone is a, a riddle in, um, in Buddhist, certain kinds of Buddhist meditative practice, which you, you repeat and think about until you achieve enlightenment. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm making this connection because Yoda was in the previous slide, but there's, there's definitely something there. Um, here's another one. So, and again, it's not, you know, it, it, it's sort of almost, you know, for a while you think you've missed the point. It, you know, it's like, am I being stupid here? Because I just don't get it. Because it's convincing, convincingly enough like a joke or convincingly enough like a meme to think that, the, so, so to evoke the, 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 one of the titles of our previous work, it, it's not you, it's me. This is the problem. I'm the problem here. 
So this is, so uh, Nathan earlier talked about this work, which is trained on a mixture of um, machine learning and computer science and uh, cybernetics literature with self-help books thrown into the mix. And again, um, so here, um, so AI trained absurdity can be a sort of heuristic for the normal. So here you can see kind of features of the writings that come from, you can see the, some of the, you, you can sort of tell yourself, okay, that feels like cybernetics, that feels like a computer science formula, that feels self-help. Um, and, um, and, it, and it kind of brings them out in sharp relief. <laughs> and then taking that as, as a starting point uh, for future creative work, uh, that, that's the point where we, we hope it gets interesting. So uh, here are some more definitions that people have, uh, uh, have um, submitted uh, to the, to the self-help book that, that's growing. Um, and again, um, I, you start to see features of the, of the AI text even reflected in the kind of use of, of language by people who are offering definitions. So in this case, it's, it's the very kind of nearness and the realness and its relationship with the absurd that allows these kinds of creative annotation. Um, so this is uh, also not going to play, um, I'm afraid. Uh, this is a rereader, which uh, Nathan mentioned earlier. Uh, um, <clears throat> so rereader is uh, a book scanner uh, which uh, takes the page of a book, uh, scans it, and kind of sort of blows it up into a number of different things. One of the things it does is trains uh, an AI to produce a new book in the style of all the books it's read. And it also does a bunch of kind of natural language processing things. So it looks for interesting words. It kind of finds the words on the page. And by doing so, it, it kind of takes very, very literally and at face value um, the kind of technical background of a lot of sort of um, genuine natural language processing or genuine AI training, um, but and it's not just about ridiculing those things. It's not you know the whole the point of the work is not to say these necessarily that these things are bad in themselves, but it's about if you take those things sort of at face value into an extreme, what what coincidences, what comings together, and what new possibilities can arise. Um, uh, so Nathan mentioned our, uh, our newspaper, If and Only If, or Crash Blossoms, which is a comparable thing using archival texts, uh, AI-generated works, and user contributions. Uh, uh, oh, that one does play, yeah. So here is this animated thing. Um, <clears throat> so it has this, again, a sort of uncomfortable and close relationship with both the news and ex as expected, the forms of news writing and its presentation, and then does something else with it. Um, I'm going to pretty much end there, um, and if, so this is my little roundup. I don't think it's a conclusion. Uh, so some, th some of the things about absurd AI is it's a question of focus. You know, it's kind of there. It helps us see things which we which we can sometimes see. Uh, the second point, it it's a way of wrapping us together. So so using it to to creatively blow apart um, uh, these these kind of cultural conventions, just like the breaching experiments I mentioned, um, allows us um, to. Uh, to produce new forms of breakage, new forms of parody, uh, and new forms of uh, absurdity. And I think this is kind of, a, as I say, a useful sort of hermeneutic, a sort of interpretive tool. And I'll finish there. Thanks very much.